This way. gentlemen welcome along to the vlog third walk of the week today being Wednesday and third location so today we're back in the usual stomping ground which is about two miles away from my house this is the National Trust's Columba Park and we're on the south side today which is away from the madding crowd and they seem to be doing a fair bit of extensive work on the brush chopping back some of the gorse and uh, some of the, um, the the early colonizer trees such as birch and whatever else there's a pile of it over there so a quick walk for the two little uh, well, turd dispensers and then into the brewery New England IPA day today. That will be interesting. Chances in the gate, waiting to get through, like a good boy. What well, he doesn't realise is, they've taken all the fences down. So you can just walk round, mate. Bless you. You're a sausage, aren't you, mate? <laughs> At least he recognises the gate when he sees one. And he remembers how they operate. Oh, what a sausage. Oh wow, look at that sky. And there's the retail section of Cumber Park. I just thought we'd stop by the lake and have a sit. I'm just taking the view. They do a nice job of maintaining that, to be honest, don't they? I say retail like area, but they need some revenue coming in to look after the whole place. And it's better than having a big knob lord of Farquhar running the place, aren't they? I believe it definitely is. Look at Reggie wants to go for a swim. Do not go in that water. There are actually lots and lots of birds here. They just seem to be on the other side of that island and round the corner of that one. Anyway, let's carry on. There we go. Bench's even got a number. I was gonna sit on this log, but I decided not to. Chance, there's somebody coming. You're gonna have to come here. All cycles to the right, so I will indeed take the cycle route simply because it is 
There is, there is. Less chance of cyclists having dogs with them. So these two can stay off the lead. So this is the lowest point of the walk. I've walked down to the Clumber Lake. Now we walk all the way back up to Clumber Park Hotel, which is about a mile, mile and a half, I think. Oh, ladies and gentlemen. New beer day, Talisman Nieper. Don't ask me why Talisman. I was thinking that song, Hey Mr. Tallyman. And I know Tallyman and Talisman are two different things. But I'm also using Talus Hops in there as well, so I think it sounds good. Anyway, that's not what's important. What is important is that the Whirlpool is getting a full five kilograms of El Dorado and Idaho 7. And then the Dry Hop is also going to feature a full four kilograms of Idaho 7 and talus that looks interesting doesn't it also got a um what's it called beersmith sheet there just check checking everything ties up whirlpool three whirlpool's different here i've only got two and two and then three and two on the dry hop so that's the wrong way around i better go and change that round so we need five kilograms on the dry hop and four kilograms on the whirlpool I thought it looked a bit short but that's no problem it shouldn't affect the IBUs um, well it, it won't affect the IBUs because I've calculated them on there so I'll just swap this round on this brew sheet it'll make no difference either in the inventory because I'm using the same amount it's just going in on a different time so I've just emptied five 25 kilogram sacks into the mash tun and that's where it is it's that far from the top if we're looking at the size of the mash tun you don't have to peek over far to see the grain it's about a hand's width just a bit more from the top so I'm just going to weigh out all the water treatment in that area there so there's lactic acid and calcium chloride keep the mouth feel nice and soft and juicy and uh, then I'm gonna have to top up the HLT because we're having to mash in with 330 litres of water then clean the boil kettle and uh, yeah brew day brew day on boys and girls this was one difficult mash so we uh, I said we it was my fault overfilled the tank with hot liquor which meant I was a little bit too close to the top as you can see to put any cold water in because we overshot the temperatures by quite a bit as you can see so what I had to do was pull some wort out and uh, put some cold water in and then I overdid that as well so we've actually mashed this beer two degrees lower than I anticipated I was looking for a fi an estimated final gravity of 10.13, looks like we're going to hit 10.10 if things pan out. I wanted a 66 degree centigrade mash, I got a 64.4 so we'll see where we go and also I've got far too much liquid for the, uh, for the mash tun. I think I should build a new mash tun, definitely. Out of the things that I've got in mind in the future to, to build a new mash tun and a new HLT and then a new boil kettle and then hopefully we'll be able to afford some new cylindro conical fermenters. I was thinking about building some cylindro conical fermenters. I know I'm going off on a tangent, I wanted to talk about the beer. But let's just quickly talk about the fermenters. I wanted to build some more, but I want some pressurated cylindro conicals and of course I won't be able to assemble those to code because I don't have the correct welding qualifications to code the welds. So whilst I'd like to build them and I found a company that does um, pressed or spun dome caps and I could do the fabrication for the cylindrical tanks and then of course I'd need to find somebody to do me a cone, roll a cone, or I was thinking about building a finger press, 
break and making the cone incrementally by cutting it out of a single sheet of steel and then crimping it round but on reflection you know dimple jacket PU insulation nice shiny stainless steel outer clad instead of this timber stuff is it really worth all that hassle and uh, you know just to have it not be usable by anyone but me because it's not built to code and it's not got the correct certification whereas the boil tank and the mash tun aren't pressure vessels so they don't come under the same stipulations so I think that's something we could have a go at well I already have done but making a bigger one I mean and of course pressing or rolling a small cone like what we've got on the bottom of this boil kettle which is perfect is a heck of a lot easier and we could just duplicate that on the top and then put a manway in it same on the HLT we'll make a, a much taller HLT probably something like uh, 2000 litre and then same with the mash tun but with the mash tun we'll have a larger diameter so we'll be more around like a hot tub style shape probably the same depth though I think any deeper than this and you do start to get compaction of the grain bed at the bottom when you're using a lot of wheat in the grist and uh, that brings us neatly back onto the mash so as you can see we are absolutely full to the brim we're actually recircling in there you can't see it because the outlet pipes underneath the mash so what I'm going to do is give it 10 minutes and then we're going to start the runoff into the boil kettle which is ready to go it's been cleaned and we're going to wait until the level drops so that that top section is exposed then I'm going to put this back in and any conversion that's left to happen on that particular batch of work will happen as it percolates through the rest of the grain but I've done an iodine test and there's no black on the sample it's completely converted whether it's converted in the right ratio of long chain and short chain sugars we are yet to find out after the product of fermentation but as it stands that's going to go back in and then when we can put the sparge arms back on we'll hook up the HLT and we'll drain as much work out of the grain as we possibly can or as we need actually so shooting for about six and a half percent ABV on the final finished product whether we get there or not is a different kettle of fish I think we've got more we're more likely to get to six and a half percent with the lower mash temperature and the higher initial mash so it's almost like batch sparging by the fact that I've got to chuck this back in look at the shimmering foam as well two kilograms of Idaho 7 two kilograms of El Dorado we haven't weighed the talus out because that goes in the dry hop so let's have a snifter of these bad boys this El Dorado is amazing oh, it just smells like citrusy fruity juicy everything going on there now the Idaho 7 this is the first time I've ever purchased any I get kind of almost a minty note off of it yeah it's got something that I can't quite put my finger on it's got a lot of fruit in there a lot of tropical fruit I don't know if it's peach or pineapple or mango that I'm getting one of those but it's sort of blended in with everything else I'm really interested to see how this beer actually turns out with all these beautiful expensive American hops and of course we're going with everyone's favorite left-wing presidential candidate the Sanders yeast look hence at the brewery it's the end of the brew day I can't remember what the last clip was that I took I guess I'll find out when I edit the video something to do with the mash perhaps what a ball ache that was I really should learn from previous experiences quicker than I actually do 125 kilograms of malt in there just pale malt but this season's 
extra pale planet seems to be a little bit more gummy than usual and I bought some beta glucanase to help thin the mash out a little bit or at least aid in sparging well I forgot to put any in didn't I and yes we got a stuck sparge probably compounded slightly by the fact that it was a lower mash temperature than I initially wanted to uh, go for two degrees lower and uh, well we're past five o'clock and I st I'm still transferring so it's one of those things you live and you learn but I've got five litres of beta gluconase in the bloody thing I should start using it anyway on to more interesting things which I know the brewers who are watching this will be intrigued in so little bit of a layout plan for a new control panel which is going to include some new safety features we're going to include an RCD a three phase RCD on each element now there is RCD protection on our main circuit board over there and I replaced all of the odds and sods MCBs and there were some random things in there let me tell you some random things Hager, Chint all that kind of it's a Proteus board so they shouldn't have been in there here's one for example so not Proteus is it a Proteus? Well, anyway whatever board it is I've made sure that everything all the MCB suit and it's got a main RCD breaker 70 amp 100 amp maybe protecting the whole shebang so what I want to do is bring some RCD protection a little bit closer to the board I'm not going to worry about MCB protection or protection for the cables themselves they're already on 20 amp breakers anyway and we're running 19 amps through these 12 kilowatt elements so we should be good on that front in fact when the solid state relay which triggered this rebuild blew the MCB tripped as well but the RCD didn't meaning that there was no fault to ground but there was an overcurrent surge which the MCB did its job and it protected the cable so I intend to just put RCD protection inside the box so that should be protecting us and uh, what made me think about it initially was we have this is taking the place of a panel meter I'll show you what a panel meter is this is a panel meter which reads the voltage across each phase and the amps across each phase or the current and it also gives you the Hertz and how many hours it's been running which had that's useless so whilst that is taking the place of that particular component to display all of those figures we have to run the main current that comes in to the control panel and all three of the uh, phases run through what's known as a current transformer or a CT I think I've got one in here so I can show you what they look like, there they are so basically each phase you pass through this little fella or clamp him on it and when an, a current goes through the wire it induces a magnetic field around it and this magnetic field then creates because there's some windings in there that creates a voltage in this cable or a current in that cable which is detected by the panel meter and displayed so the current rating side of it is all safe and sound but it's also reading the line to line voltage and in order to do that you need to run a cable from one of the feeds directly into this so that means you've potentially got 415 volts live just on the back of the door on the panel 
which is fine, it's a 415 rated panel anyway, but it did make me think, what if we sprayed it with a hose pipe and water actually got in, then this is why I thought about putting those RCDs there. So then if there was any current leakage to ground, it would do, it would trip. And also what I'm gonna do is in those cables that are running here, I'm gonna put really small cables in, like 0.5 millimeter. They don't need to carry any current, maybe even smaller than that. And I'm gonna see if I can get some triple insulated, double insulated should do, because it's also in an enclosure. So that should be fine, double insulated cables. And that means that uh, if there is an overload fault in the panel meter, shouldn't happen, then the cable will burn out before the box sets on fire. And also double insulated means if we trap that three-phase cable anywhere in the door and we've got it open, there's less chance of it um, being damaged. But if it is, then the RCDs will pick that up anyway. So that is going to be a panel meter. I should really zoom out a bit more here. This is going to take place of the seven day timer. So I can set this to come on in the morning when I'm not here to heat up the HLT. I don't have any spare ink, but well I do, I've got one spare ink bird. But over here we'll have the HLT and boil kettle controls. I've no need for a mash tun control here. I take a manual reading with a mash tun uh, thermometer. Doesn't need to be displayed on the panel. So that the one that I've got on the panel outside is never used. Let's do away with it. Over this side, this is taking place of the countdown timer with its reset button and it's on and off switch. And then it's alarm buzzer on the top to let us know when the mash is up or there's a 10 minute addition needs to go in, whatever. This square box here, full of relays, is taking place of the panel water meter. So I use this to uh, determine how much water I'm using for my sparge. So I'll set it to 220 litres and then I'll fill up the mash tun with 220 litres for the dough in. And then I'll set it to run with how many litres I need for the sparge as well. So that is used on a twice a day, if not more. So that's staying. Here we're going to have the key on and off. We're doing away with the panel indicator for the key switch because the, it illuminates. You don't need another light. Obviously we'll keep the mains, um, the heating element uh, on and off switches here with their indicators. And what I like to do is wire the output signal through this. So I'm basically switching the output signal of the ink bird and that has to go through a float switch on the boil kettle and then back in and to a, uh, what's it called, solid state relay. So there are certain, a number of tiers of protection to prevent that solid state relay energising accidentally. Like if there's no water in the tank, she no come on. If I don't switch on here, she no come on. And then we are going to move. I'm, I was just thinking then for a moment, in order for this indicator to come on, I think what I did last time was I wired a 12 volt supply through this switch, which when turned on would power this panel indicator. And that went through to a 12 volt relay, which came on when you turn that switch on. And that relay, when energised, allowed the inkbird signal, output signal, to then go to the boil kettle and back into the SSRs. Because obviously I, don't, I wasn't draining the current capacity that the inkbird could provide by powering an LED. You get my drift, I'm sure you do. And then all these switches down here are for decoration only. We're going to probably put in the mash pump, HLT pump. I no longer use the boil pump on uh, a switch on the control panel because I've got it wired up to an external plug-in timer. So when I go home at night, I can just set it to run for an hour and then she turns off. Uh, so 
it can CIP when I'm not here. And then I come back tomorrow morning, everything's cooled down. And I just hose it out and rinse. I do power some uh, an LED strip, which is at the back of the sight glass on the HLT. That allows me to see what level the HLT is at. Um, I'll probably keep that in the panel. Doesn't necessarily have to be a switch living down here though. So that'll be la labelled HLT lights. Could do with putting some lights elsewhere as well. Maybe behind the sight glass on the outlet of the plate chiller. So we can have a nice photo opportunity when we're taking wood off the um, off the plate chiller into fermenter. See how clear it is. But it's not essential at the minute. And uh, I don't very often use that as a metric to how clear the beer is going to be anyway. Simply because sometimes, like today, it's hazy as frig because I had a stuck mash and, you know, we'll treat that in the tank and just drop the troop there. And then along the bottom, I've screwed this section to the bottom. I know a lot of people will spin these upside down and put their heat sinks here for the SSR so they don't have to drill a big or cut a big section out. I know that's what Tom did on his box that we've never seen used. Come on, Thomas, get brewing. So, um... I'm going to use this to install all of my um, cables which need soldering. So I'm going to drill the holes in this. I'm going to put all of the panel mount connectors in there. And I'm just going to solder tails to it. And then I can do it on the bench without having my head in the panel. And then I can screw the panel to the panel. That makes sense. And then just run all the wires around to where they need to go. Make a sense? It does in my head. And then on the side, I've, I've got some panel mount um, three phase. Up. So even though I've bought these, these bad boys, you can see it in the dark. I know it's dark. Forgive me. Yeah, 32 amp outlets. We may not be using them because, well, why put a cable gland in and then just run out something like that? Let's just panel mount it. So hopefully I can fit one, two, three, one, two, three, I don't know, one, two, three, who knows. We'll jig what we've got to jig. And there we go, that's a rundown. 13 minutes that's taken me. Well, I think that's enough to end the video then, isn't it? Otherwise it's going to be an extremely long format. So, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. I'll give you one last look of the brewery before we sign off. And say, go and buy some beer from harrisonsbrewery.com forward slash shop. We'll see you on the next one. Friggin' rights, we will.